From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Vellante of the Cube, and welcome back to my CXO series. I've been running this series really since the start of the COVID-19 crisis to really understand how leaders are dealing with this pandemic. Three Embody is here. He's the CEO and founder of H2O. Three, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so this pandemic has obviously given um, people fits, no question, but it's also given opportunities for companies to kind of reassess where they are. Automation is a huge watchword, flexibility, business resiliency, and people who maybe really hadn't fully leaned into things like the cloud and, and AI and automation are now realizing, wow, we have no choice. It's about survival. Um, your thoughts as to what you're seeing in the marketplace. Thanks for having us. I think, uh, first of all, um, kudos to the frontline uh, health workers who have been um, relentlessly saving lives um, across the country and the world. Um, and uh, whatever we're doing is, uh, uh, is a fraction of what we could have done or should be doing to stay away the next big pandemic. Uh, but that apart, I think um, I, I usually tend to say BC is before COVID. So um, if the world has uh, was thinking about going digital uh, after COVID-19, um, they have been forced to go digital. And as a result, we're seeing tremendous transformation across our customers um, and uh, a lot of um, application um, to kind of um, re go in and reinvent their business models that allow them to scale as effortlessly as they could using uh, the digital means. So, Think about um, uh, doctors and, and diagnoses. Machines, in some cases, are helping doctors make diagnoses. They're sometimes making even better diagnoses, at least informing. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the models. You know, how the, yeah, I know you've been working with a lot of healthcare organizations. Uh, you may probably be familiar with that, you know, the medium post, the hammer and the dance. And then people criticize the models. Of course, they're just models, right? And, you iterate models and machine intelligence can help us Im improve. So in this, you know, you, you talk about BC and, and post C, how have you seen the, the data and, and machine intelligence informing the models, improving sort of what we know about this uh, pandemic? I mean, it changed literally daily. What are you seeing? Yeah, no, I think it started with Wuhan and we saw um, the best application of AI in trying to trace um, literally uh, from Alipay to WeChat, uh, track down the first uh, folks who were spreading it across uh, China and then eventually the rest of the world. I think uh, contact tracing, for example, has become a really interesting problem. Um, supply chain has been disrupted like never before. We're beginning to see customers um, trying to reinvent their distribution mechanisms um, in the second order effects of the, of the, of the COVID. In the, uh, in the prime center is hospital staffing, uh, how many ventilators, it's the first few weeks of the, of the COVID crisis as it, uh, as it evolved in, in the US. We were busy predicting, working with some of the local healthcare communities to predict how many um, hospital, uh, how, how staffing in hospitals would work, how many PPE and ventilators would be needed and so on and so forth. But that quickly, um, um, and when this peak, when the peak surge will be, those were the beginning problems. And many of our customers are beginning to do these models and and iterate and improve and kind of educate the community to do to do social to practice social distancing. And that led to a lot of uh, flattening the curve. When you're talking about flattening the curve, you're really talking about data science and analytics um, in 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 public speak. That led to kind of uh, the next level. Um, um, now that we have somewhat brought a, a semblance of order to this, um, to the uh, reaction to, to COVID. I think what we are beginning to figure out is, is there going to be a second search? Uh, what elective procedures that were postponed uh, will be used, will be, will, will be top of the mind for customers? And so this is the kind of things that hospitals are beginning to plan out for the second half of the year. And as businesses try to open up, certain things um, were highly correlated to surge in cases. Uh, such as uh, uh, such as cleaning supplies, for example, the obvious one, or pantry buying. Um, so retailers are beginning to see what um, online uh, um, st stores are doing well, e-commerce, uh, online purchases, electronic goods, 
And so uh, everyone essentially started working from home. And so homes needed to have the same kind of bandwidth that offices and commercial enterprises needed to have. And so a lot of interesting, uh, um, as one side you saw airlines go away, the other side you saw the, the likes of Zoom and online and, and video take off. So you're kind of seeing um, a, a, a real di divide in the digital divide and that's happening. And AI is here to play a very good role to figure out how to uh, enhance your profitability as you're looking about planning out the next two years. Yeah, you know, and obviously these things, they get, it, they get partisan, they get, it gets political. I mean, our job as an industry is to report. Your job is to help, help people understand. I mean, let the data inform and then let public policy, you know, fight it out. So who are some of the people that you're working with um, that, you know, as a result of COVID-19, what's some of the work that, that H2O has done? I want to, I want to better understand what role you're playing. So one of the things uh, we are kind of privileged um, as, a, as a company to come into the crisis with a strong balance and, a, and an ability to actually, uh, and the right kind of momentum behind the company in terms of great talent. And so we have 10% uh, of the world's top data scientists in the, in the form of Kaggle grandmasters in the company. And so we put most of them to, to work and they started collecting data sets, curating data sets uh, and, and, and making them more qualitative uh, picking up public data sources, for example, there's a tremendous amount of job loss out there, uh, figuring out uh, which are the more uh, uh, difficult uh, um, kind of uh, sectors in the economy. And then we started looking at exodus from the cities, by right? looking at mobility data that's publicly available, mobility data uh, through the data exchanges. We were able to find which cities, which rural areas did the New, York, the, the New Yorkers as they left the city, which uh, which places did they go to and versus say Californians when they left Los Angeles, which are the new places they have settled in. These are the places which are now busy places for uh, the same kind of um, uh, items that you need to sell um, if you're a retailer. But uh, if you go one step further, we started engaging with FEMA, we started engaging with, with uh, the universities um, uh, like Imperial College London or Berkeley and started figuring out how best to improve the models and automate them. Uh, the SEER model, the most popular SEER model, we added that into our, our, our driverless AI product as a recipe and um, made that accessible to our customers in testing, uh, uh, to customers in healthcare who are trying to predict um, where the search is likely to come. But it's mostly about information, right? Sort of, uh, AI is at the end of it is all about intelligence and being prepared. Predictive uh, uh, is all about being prepared. And, and, and that's kind of what we did with uh, general lots of blog, typical blog articles and working with the uh, largest uh, health organizations um, and started uh, starting to kind of inform them on the most uh, stable models. Uh, what we found uh, to our not so much surprise is that the simplest, very interpretable models are actually the most widely uh, usable because historical data is actually uh, no longer as effective. You need to be, build a model that you can quickly understand and, and retry again to the feedback loop of backtesting that model against uh, what really happened. Yeah, so I, I want to uh, double down on that. So really two things I want to understand, if, if you have visibility on it, it sounds like you do, just in terms of the surge and the comeback, you know, kind of what those models say based upon, you know, we have some advanced uh, information coming from, from the global market for sure, but it seems like every situation is different. Um, what are you, what are your, what are you, what's the data telling you just in terms of, okay, we're coming into the, the spring and the summer months, maybe it'll calm down a little bit. Um, everybody says we fully expect it to come back in the fall, you know, go back to college, don't go back to college. What is the data telling you at this point in time with an understanding that, you know, we're, we're still iterating every day? Well, I think, I mean, we're, we're not epidemiologists, but at the same time, um, the, 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 the science of it is a high, highly local uh, response, um, very hyper-local response to COVID-19 is what we've seen. Um, uh, Santa Clara, uh, which, is a, which is the county I'm in, is different from San Francisco, right? Sort of, so we're beginning to see, uh, and like we saw in Brooklyn, it's very different, and Bronx very different from Manhattan. So you're seeing a very, very local response to this uh, disease, and I'm talking about the US, uh, you, you see the likes of um, Brazil, which we, we were um, uh, worried about, has picked up quite a bit of cases now. 
I think the silver lining, I would say, is that China is up and running um, to a large degree. A large number of our um, user base there are back active. You can see the traffic patterns there. So two months uh, after um, after their um, uh, after their last uh, of the surge cases, uh, the business and economic activity is back uh, and 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 thriving. And so you can kind of estimate from that that. Uh, this can be done, where you can actually contain the uh, rise of active cases, um, and it will take masking of the uh, entire uh, community, masking and the, and, the, and, the, and the healthy dose of increase in testing. Um, uh, one of our uh, one of our offices is in uh, Prague, and uh, Czech Republic has done an incredible job in trying to contain this, um, uh, and they've done essentially uh, masked everybody, and uh, as a result, they're back thinking about opening offices later this uh, schools later this month so i think that's a very very local response hyper local response no one country and no one um, um, community has uh, uh, is symmetrical with the other ones and i think we we have a unique situation where it, uh, in the united states you have a very very um, um, highly connected world highly connected economy and i think we have a, 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 a quite a quite a um, uh, quite, quite a problem on our hands on how to how to uh, safeguard our economy while also um, uh, safeguarding life. Yeah, so you can't just you can't just take Norway and apply it or South Korea and apply it. Every situation is different. And, and then I want to ask you about you know the the, the economy um, in terms of you know how much can AI actually you know how do, how can it work in in this situation where you have. You know, for example, okay, so the Fed, yes, it, it, it started doing asset buys back in 2008, uh, but it's still very hard to predict. I mean, at the time of this, this interview, the stock market's up 900 points. And very, very difficult to predict that. If some event happens in the morning, somebody, you know, Powell says something positive and it goes crazy. But just sort of even modeling out the V recovery, the W recovery, the deep recession, the, 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 the comeback. You have to have enough data, do you not, in order for AI to be um, reasonably accurate? How does it work? And, and how does, at what pace can you iterate and improve on the models? So I think that's exactly where um, I would say um, um, continuous modeling, right? sort of continuously learning containers. Um, that's where the vision of the, of the world is headed towards, where data is coming in, you build a model, and then you iterate try it out and come back, that kind of rapid uh, continuous learning would probably be needed for all our models, as opposed to the typical, I'm pushing a model into production once a year or once every uh, quarter. Uh, I think the, I think what we're beginning to see is um, the kind of um, where um, companies are beginning to kind of plan out. Um, a lot of people lost their jobs in the last um, couple of months, right? Sort of, um, and so uh, upskilling um, and trying to kind of bring back um, these uh, jobs back um, both into kind of um, the, uh, both from the manufacturing side, but also um, a lot, lost a lot of jobs in the transportation and, um, and the kind of the airline slash uh, uh, hotel um, uh, industries. Right? Sort of, so trying to now uh, bring back the sense of confidence and uh, will take a lot more um, uh, kind of testing, a lot more masking, a lot more uh, social empathy. I think some of the things that we are missing uh, while we are socially distant, we, we know that we are so connected as a species, uh, we need to kind of start having that empathy for, we, we, we need to wear a mask, not for ourselves, but for our neighbors and, and, and people we may run into. And I think those, that kind of, uh, uh, the same kind of uh, thinking has to kind of pervade before we can open up the economy in a big way. The data, I mean, uh, we can do a lot of transfer learning, right? Sort of there are new methods, uh, like try to model it uh, similar to the 1918, uh, where we had a second bump or a lot of little bumps. And that's kind of where your W shaped uh, pieces. But governments are trying very, very strong, very, um, very well. We're seeing stimulus dollars being pumped through banks. So some of the use cases we're looking for banks is which small, medium business, uh, in, especially in unsecured lending, which business to lend to, and if you, uh, there's so many applications to that have come to banks across the world. Uh, it's not just in the U.S. And uh, banks are uh, caught up with the problem of which, what's the going concern for this business to kind of, uh, are they really uh, accurate about the number of employees they are saying they have? 
to then the next level problem around forbearance and um, and uh, mortgage. Um, um, that side of the things are coming up at some of these banks as well. So they're looking at which, what's one of the problems that one of our customers, uh, Wells Fargo, they have a question, which which uh, branch to open, right? Sort of that, uh, that itself, it needs a different kind of uh, modeling. So everything has become a very highly good segmented models. And so AI is absolutely not just um, a, a good to have, it has become a must have for most of our customers in how to go about their business. We're talking, about, another... uh, we'll talk a little bit about your business. Um, you have been on a mission to democratize AI since, since the beginning. Um, lot, uh, open source, uh, how, how, tell, explain your business model, how you guys make money. And then I want to help people understand basic uh, some historical comparisons and current comparisons. Yeah, that's great. I think uh, the last time we spoke, um, uh, probably about at the Spark uh, Summit, I think, Dave, and we yep. uh, we were uh, talking about sparkling water and H2O or open source platforms, which are uh, premier platforms for um, uh, democratizing machine learning and math at scale. And, uh, and that's built a tremendous brand for us. Uh, over the last couple of years, we have essentially built a platform called Driverless AI, which is uh, a licensed software, and that uh, automates machine learning um, models. We took the best practices of all these uh, data scientists and uh, combined them to essentially uh, build recipes that allow people to build the best forecasting models, best fraud prevention models, or the best recommendation engines. Um, and so we started um, augmenting uh, traditional data scientists with this automatic machine learning called AutoML, which uh, that essentially allows them to build models without necessarily having the same level of talent as these great uh, tackle grandmasters. And so that has democratized the, the allowed ordinary uh, companies to start producing models of high caliber and high quality that would otherwise have been the pedigree of Google, Microsoft, or or Amazon, or or some of these uh, top tier AI AI houses like Netflix and others. So what we've done is democratize not just uh, the algorithms at a, a open source level, now we've made it easy for uh, kind of rapid adoption of AI across every branch inside a, a large organization, also across small organizations which don't have the access to the same kind of talent. Now, third level, you know, what we brought to market is ability to augment um, data sets, especially public and private data sets that you can, um, the alternative data sets uh, that can increase the signal and that's where we, we've um, started working on a new platform called Q, again, more licensed software. And, um, so, and I mean, to give you an idea, Dave, from business model standpoint, now majority of our software, uh, of our software um, sales is coming from closed source software. Instead of, so we've made that uh, transition. We still make our open source widely accessible. We continue to improve it. A large chunk of the teams are improving and, and participating in building the communities. But I think, um, it, from a business model standpoint, uh, as of last year, 51% of our revenues are now coming from closed source software, and that's, that, change, that change is continuing to grow. And this is the point I wanted to get to. So, you know, the open source model was, you know, Red Hat, the one company that, you know, succeeded wildly, and it was put it out there open source, come up with a service to, to maintain the software, you got to buy the subscription, okay, fine. And everybody thought, that, that you, know, you were going to do that. They thought that's what Databricks was going to do and that, that changed. But I want to take two examples. Uh, Hortonworks, which kind of took the, the, the Red Hat model in Cloudera, which has IP uh, and, and neither really lived up to the expectations. But now there seems to be sort of a new breed. I mentioned you guys, Databricks, there are others that seem to be working. You with your licensed software model, Databricks with a managed service and so there's it's, 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 it's becoming clearer that there's got to be some level of, of, of IP that can be licensed in order to really thrive in the, in the open source community to be able to fund the committers that you have to put forth to open source. I wonder if you could give me your thoughts on that narrative. So um, on driverless AI, which is the closed source platform I mentioned, we opened up the layers above um, in open source as recipes. So, for example, different companies build their zip codes differently, right? Sort of the domain-specific uh, recipes, we put about 150 of them in open source again on top of our driverless AI platform. And the idea there is that open source 
is about freedom, right? It is not necessarily about, it's not a philosophy, it's not a business model. It's a, it allows freedom for rapid adoption of a platform and complete democratization and commodification of a space. And that allows a small company like ours to compete at the level of an SAS or a, a Google or a Microsoft because you are you have the same level of voice as a very large company and you're focused on using code as a community building exercise as opposed to a um, a, 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 a business model right so, so that's kind of the heart of open source is allowing that freedom for our end users and the customers to kind of innovate at the same level of uh, that a Silicon Valley company or one of these large tech giants are are building software. So it's really about making, it's a maker culture as opposed to a consumer culture around software. Now, if you look at how the uh, the Red Hat model um, and the uh, others have tried to replicate that, the difficult part there was if the product is um, very good, customers are self-sufficient, and if it becomes a standard, then it, uh, customers know how to use it. If the product is crippled or difficult to use, then you put a lot of services. And that's where you saw the, the classic Hadoop uh, companies uh, spe- uh, get pulled into a lot of services, which is a reasonably difficult business to scale. So I think uh, what we chose was instead a great product that builds a fantastic brand that uh, makes AI. We were one of the first or second dot AI domain. And for us to see thousands of companies uh, which are dot AI and, and AI first, and even more companies adopting AI and talking about AI as a major wave that was possible because of open source. If you had chosen closed source and many of our peers did, they all vanished. So that's kind of how the, the open source is really about building the ecosystem and having that patience to build a company that takes 10, 20 years to build. And uh, what we are expecting, unfortunately, is a fast and uh, fast uh, rise up to become unicorns. In that race, you're essentially sacrifice building a, a long ecosystem play. And that's kind of what, uh, we chose to do, and that took a little longer. Now, if you think about the how do you um, truly monetize open source, it takes a little longer and much, it's much more difficult sales machine to scale, right? Sort of our open source business actually is reasonably positive EBITDA business because it makes more money than we spend on it. But trying to teach sales teams how to sell open source, that's a much that's a rate limiting step, and that's why we chose. And also explaining to the investors how open source uh, it needs to be invested in as you go closer to the IPO markets. That's where we chose, let's go into license software model and scale that as a regular business. So I've, I've said a few times, it's kind of like ironic that this pandemic hit just as we're entering a new decade. You know, we've kind of, we're exiting the, the era. I mean, the, the many, many decades of Moore's law being the source of innovation. And now it's a combination of data applying machine intelligence and being able to scale and with cloud. Well, my question is, what should we expect out of AI this decade? If those are sort of the three, the cocktail of innovation, if you will, what should we expect? Is it really just about, I suggest, is it really about automating you know, businesses, giving them more agility, flexibility, you know, et cetera? Or should we, should we expect more from AI this decade? Well, I mean, if you think about um, um, the, the decade of 2010, 2011, um, that was defined by software is eating the world, right? And now you can say software is the world, right? I mean, pretty much almost all conversations are digital. And um, AI is eating software. And it's, it's, I mean, if you, a lot of cloud transitions um, are happening um, and are now happening much faster rate but cloud and AI are kind of the leading. AI is essentially one of the biggest um, driver for cloud adoption for many of our customers. Um, so in the enterprise world, you're seeing rebuilding of a lot of um, data fast, data driven uh, applications that use AI. Instead of rule based software, you're beginning to see patent recognition AI based software, and you're seeing that in spades. Um, and of course, uh, that is just the tip of the iceberg. AI is, has been with us for uh, 100 years and it's going to be with, uh, ahead of us another 100 years, right? Sort of, so as you see the discovery um, the rate at which um, AI is really a fundamentally a math um, 
uh, math movement. And um, in that math movement, at, at the beginning of every century, it leads to 100 years of uh, phenomenal discovery. So AI is essentially making discoveries faster. AI is producing um, entertainment. AI is producing music. AI is producing choreography. We're seeing AI in every walk of life. Um, AI summarization of uh, of, uh, of Zoom meetings. Right? You're beginning to see a lot of the uh, AI-enabled uh, uh, um, um, ETF picking of uh, stocks. Right? So you're beginning to see... Uh, we, we reprise 20,000 bonds every 15 seconds using uh, H2O AI, uh, corporate bonds. And so, you're, you, and one of our customers is on the, uh, the fa fastest growing stock. Uh, mostly, um, um, mostly AI is uh, powering a lot of these insights in a fast changing world, which is um, globally connected. N no one of us um, uh, is able to uh, combine all the multiple dimensions that are changing. And AI has that incredible uh, opportunity to be a partner for uh, for every uh, for a for a uh, for a for a hospital looking at um, uh, what how the second half will look like to for a uh, physicians looking at uh, what is the sentiment um, um, of um, of um, what is the surge to expect to kind of what is the market looking at the sentiment of the of the customers. Um, AI is the ultimate money ball you can play in business. And and I think um, it's it's just showing its uh, its its depth at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right on. I mean, basically, AI is going to in every piece of software, every application, or 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 those tools aren't going to have much use. Three, we got to go. But thanks so much for coming to the cube and the great work you guys are doing. Really appreciate your insights. Stay safe and and best of luck to you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Welcome thanks, and thank thanks. you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante for the CXO series on theCUBE. We'll see you next time.